Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Sandbox AQ webcast on the topic of cybersecurity for the quantum era. So my name is Graham Steele. Uh, just to give a bit of background about myself, I'm the head of product for the quantum security group here at Sandbox AQ. So I have a PhD in cryptography, and after 10 years in research, I founded a company called CryptoSense that made software for cryptography, discovery, and analysis. That company was acquired by Sandbox AQ in 2022, which is how I'm here. Uh, and I'm delighted to be joined today for this discussion by two eminent and experienced practitioners in the world of cybersecurity. So I have with me Dr. Colin Suter, who's the Managing Director at Deloitte, and Dr. Edward Amoroso, who is the CEO of the Alice firm, Tag Cyber. So I'm going to introduce Colin, you first. So you're the leader of cyber and strategic risk products and technology in government and public services at Deloitte. Uh, with a background in biometrics, digital identity and cybersecurity, and more than 25 years of experience, including a decade as a CTO of the public company in Canada that we, we won't name. Colin is also serving on the World Economic Forum Global Future Council for Cybersecurity. Welcome, Colin. Thank you, Graham. And Ed, uh, well, as well as being the founder of TAG Cyber, uh, founded in 2016 to democratize research and advisory services, He's also a professor at NYU, nice gig, uh, and a former executive at AT&T, and he's been recognized as one of the top 50 cybersecurity industry leaders by Business Insider. Thanks for joining us, Ed. I'm looking forward to it. Um, this is such a, uh, an interesting and relevant topic, so I, I'm looking very much forward to the conversation. Awesome. Thanks very much for joining us. So we're going to have a little chat here uh, for about 30 minutes about the topic uh, of cybersecurity in the quantum era. Uh, there is a Q&A window that say, it seems some of you discovered already, which is always great to see. Uh, but please go ahead and uh, add um, your questions there either during the session or we'll do the, run the Q&A at the end. Uh, of course, we might not get to everyone, but we will uh, try to pick up Q&A afterwards uh, uh, by email for people who have got interesting questions there. So please go ahead and, and, and add your stuff there. So let's uh, dive right in. So looking at who's joined us on the call, uh, I'm guessing that uh, some people will already have a pretty good uh, background on this topic, but just to level set, Colin, can I ask you to summarize how will the world of quantum computers, so large practical error correcting quantum computers, uh, affect uh, cybersecurity uh, as we know it today? Yeah, thanks, Graham. And uh, apologies, I've actually had to dial in today, so apologies if I look like a bad friend. for a twist back with a slight dime delay there, but uh, thanks for that question. You know, one of the things about this particular topic is that uh, we find that there's a lot of conflation of the different aspects of it, and I think it's very important from a cybersecurity perspective to focus in on the aspects that are relevant to that. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's a lot of discussion about quantum computers, the, uh, you know, all of the simulation and modeling that they can do. Then you get into quantum technologies like QKD, QRNG, uh, quantum communications, and then people talk about cyber. And of course, they're all sort of interconnected, right? But I think that the important thing uh, to bear in mind is that there is a particular threat that happens to manifest itself in a quantum computer. That is, once they're large scale enough and robust enough that they can implement an algorithm, Shor's algorithm, uh, that will attack uh, some of the current day cryptography, specifically asymmetric cryptography. Uh, and at that point, then uh, data that are protected using that or communications, typically key exchanges and the like, uh, would be subject uh, to an attack. So, so, you know, as much as there's a lot of excitement, discussion around quantum computers, when they're going to be around and all that sort of thing, uh, it's important to think from a cybersecurity perspective, there is a threat, which happens to be this quantum threat. What should we do to try and mitigate that threat? And how should it be prioritized among the other risks that we look at on a daily basis? Right, right. So Ed, I'm gonna ask you a question about this that we get asked often. So, so given that we know that there's this threat from a quantum computer in the future uh, that's gonna be able to break our, our asymmetric cryptography, do I need a quantum computer to defend myself from this threat? <laughs> well, I'm not sure one would help you. Um, but um, my, my observation is, and I'll, I'll bet this is true, the people who are listening today, that there are two camps here that would answer your question a little differently. One camp would be sort of the math community, the ones um, 
who actually might have a prayer of understanding the foundational lattice theory under <laughs> these new algorithms. I, I taught um, uh, linear algebra in graduate school, and I can't make heads or tails out of uh, some of the algorithms. I watched about five YouTube videos, and I've tried, but there's that community. And, and they'll give you a certain answer about the, the offense and defense and whether quantum computers will provide much assistance. But the other camp would be the IT group. That, those would be the ones who would be very inclined to ask you about um, deployment and use of this stuff. And they would probably be more inclined to say that the biggest risk here is not really knowing where to upgrade, not knowing your inventory, just the basic day-to-day -day problems of having a complete lack of crypto agility. So they'd be more inclined to say that if you're trying to minimize the risk, you'd be wise to do a lot of basic IT stuff long before you start worrying about um, the the issue of, you know, the fighting it out between different types of um, cryptographic engines when we get to that point where there's um, sufficient power to do that. So I, I'm, I'm not sure I answered your question, but I would say that probably wouldn't be the question to ask right now. I, again, that latter camp, when they think about this topic, I think most of them, there's probably a lot of people listening right now, think, all right, great, I understand why we need these algorithms, but there's a greater fear that fumbling the implementation, um, you know, just doing a very bad job of the upgrade, the IT work associated with that, is a much greater concern than whether someone's, uh, you know, whether I need to get a quantum computer to fight off um, you know, some of these things. So you'll, you'll hear a lot of that through the discussion from me because I'm very in tune with the concerns that a lot of day-to-day -day IT operations teams have. They, they don't know where their crypto is right now. And I think that's the biggest concern. Yeah, right, can, I, can, I right. that, can I jump in on that? Can I jump in on that, Graham? Because we similarly, and I, 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 yeah, I really agree with what I was saying there. I mean, I think we did a paper a few years ago for the World Economic Forum on different personas and how they should care about this, you know, this threat. And it really is different through different eyes. I mean, if you think about it simplistically, um, you know, the chief information security officer is obviously worried about cyber threats, as they should be, and they're trying to prioritize how they could admit sort of things. But if you look through the CIO lens, then, you know, they're, they're probably more concerned about business continuity. And, and what does this mean for me? And that's been one of our bigger concerns and why we've engaged Fairly, fairly heavily into some of the communications, you know, the World Economic Forum and helping them with their program because, uh, you know, there's a tendency, and I think it's aggravated with what I said at the start about, well, we don't know when it's going to happen, when should we act? And, and if people put it off, like there's a great risk of having to hurry and upgrade. And you can, you can imagine what all the bad implications of that would be, right, from a, from a business continuity perspective. So, I feel that to a certain extent, the, the, the quantum aspect of the of the threat and the ambiguity, the conflation that it causes, actually causes a little bit of stasis in some people where they're thinking, oh, I don't have to worry about that until there's a real quantum computer. We know that's not the case. I mean, really, to me, it comes down to the fundamental question. If you, Whatever it is, if you accept that there's a finite probability that a quantum computer can be commercially viable and stable enough to implement sure, let's say, in 10 years' time, how long is it going to take you to upgrade your infrastructure, including the OT devices, by the way? Is it eight years, 10 years, 12 years? So you, mean, you really got to start, as Ed said, the inventory, understand the vulnerabilities, before you can think, ah, oh, it's way off in the future. I, I don't know how many steps that are needed to get to that future from a remediation perspective. And that's, that's where we're sitting with our clients right now. Yeah, that's very interesting. So so just I'm going to play that back to you to, to make sure I, I understood that. So the business continuity risk that I, I should be worried about, maybe I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not super worried personally that a, a quantum computer is going to break my data and, and cause a risk that way. The risk is my rush to upgrade, right? When I really need to upgrade, when suddenly the quantum computer is, is clearly and apparently just a couple of years away, trying to make this upgrade to cryptography that resists quantum computers in a hurry without an inventory and without clarity of what I'm doing, that's going to cause me a business risk. So yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, and, interesting. And, and, so, and so, so, crypto agility, right? I think that's one of the key phrases that we'll play out today. When you, when yeah, you talk right, exactly. to security people, for example, about things like certification authority, a, a security person, most of us, would say, oh, yeah, well, provides um, 
validation of our public key cryptography. They're wonderful. Ask someone in the CIO world about certificates, and they say, oh, there's those things that keep expiring and causing problems. You know, why do we need that? You know, so it's so funny how you know, the perspectives are fundamentally different, especially for things like cryptography, which unfortunately can be kind of invisible. You know what I mean? Like if you buy a SIM and you install it, you can do this beautiful demo and you can dim the lights and show the screen. Like I'm sure Splunk does that all the time. They make these big sales. When you're selling crypto, like what's the demo? <laughs> kind of isn't one, you know, the lack of something happening, I guess. So, so it really is a, a, a difficult process. And I do agree that the outage and the rush to, to deploy is to me the urgency today. Like when people go, oh my gosh, should you, you know, are we worried about the, like the store now decrypt later, that, that very common, commonly cited threat? I would say, well, yeah, I mean, that, that's certainly from a risk perspective an issue, but I think the bigger issue is if you start now, it's gonna take you, you know, 36 to 60 months or any non-trivial organization to get this done. And on the point regarding, say, 10 years before you have computers, that's probably reasonable. But when you're in the cybersecurity business, you look at a range and you have to you have to design to the worst case. And it's possible, like what in this say maybe seven years, that the Y2Q could be could be five years, you don't know. So that range, I think you, you while it would be very reasonable to assume that it's some number of years off, you never know. So so all of those things point to crypto agility being the issue, which is so funny because that's such an IT concept. You know, it's such a immediate do something now and it, the actions you take look very IT as opposed to um, maybe some of the more intellectually satisfying discussions around lattice theory and the math and the NIST, you know, all the, the different algorithms. That stuff is fun, but I think the work here is more IT. Got it. Right. Okay, so that takes us nicely then to this topic of, of crypto agility, which is, you know, a phrase that's going around a lot as being part of the, you know, the path to get ready for PQC or, the, or the, the kind of solution to the quantum thread or whatever it is. So it seems there's, there's a lot of, you know, different ideas about there about what it is. So let me let me put you on the spot again, Colin. Tell me what is uh, crypto agility? Crypto agility to us is the ability to upgrade uh, cryptographic algorithms, key management, certificates, and the like, in as transparent a way as, as possible. Um, in other words, without any uh, discontinuity of business operations. So, you know, one, once you pull the trigger and you make that update, there's there's a lot of certificates need to be updated. There's a lot of back-end operations. Uh, being able to do that in a straightforward way without it being apparent to the end user or ideally, even to the business, is the ideal way. In a very boring way, <laughs> back to the, it'd be perfunctory and boring uh, without any fun. So I like that, if, so that um, definition together, maybe he can add his. I think that that's a wonderful definition. I'll give you, maybe here's a question that people can ask themselves. And if the answer is either no or I don't know, then you probably don't have crypto agility. Let's say uh, when we're done with our webinar here, uh, the CEO of IBM goes gets on TV and says, hey, <laughs> big breakthrough. We can, we're keeping this secret, but we're all set. We've got a cryptographically relevant, you know, whatever he would say, quantum, and boy, we can, we can rock and roll now. So guess what? We're all at risk. So it, unlikely, but just as a thought experiment, if that were to happen, what would you do? Like if you're a, you work at a bank or you work in a telecom, as I did for most of my career, or you work anywhere, you work in the government, what would you do? Like, do you have any idea what you would do? If you say, I know exactly what we do. We have a clear inventory. We have a process for upgrade. We put the blah, blah, blah. Then great. That's the definition of crypto agility. If you say, I have no idea what we would do. Like we would be in scramble mode. And for the next three weeks, we'd be running around in circles. Then you don't have crypto agility, and that—that's why I say it's—it's it's not real sexy stuff. You know, it's doing the kinds of things that, um, you know, allow inventory discovery, getting a real clear picture of your posture, right? Your um, what what you've got deployed and, and where. So, um, so again, if somebody's listening and you go and you say, "I have no idea what we would do," well, then you got a little bit of work to do. 
admittedly, you've got some time here. Now, it's not like drop everything and go cancel your meetings this afternoon. But but you do want to bring some urgency here because it, this isn't as easy as um, someone who is a, say, a non-practitioner would presume. A lot, a, a lot of mathematicians sometimes say that. Like I go to talks and they'll say there are basically two requirements for these post-quantum uh, algorithms. One, you know, they need to obviously handle the threat. And two, they had to run on classical computers. And then they leave it there. And I want to raise my hand and say, there's a three. You have to be able to deploy it, manage it. Like, it'd be a product that I can run and put, like, the, that's where the tire hits the road. So from theory to practice is a big, big, giant leap. And, and I worry that that's where most companies are going to have trouble because we're going to have out there, public key uh, crypto, crypto graphic algorithms that'll work. Maybe between now and Y2Q, some of the ones, even the ones that have been picked by NIST, you never know, they could get, you know, someone could easily come along, a smart person comes along and finds a break. That, that seems likely to me. I think that that sort of thing could happen. But when you do have the algorithms, handing it over to the team and say, okay, now go put this in, in, in place, like in a telco, that's not easy. That is a tough process. I've, I've, I've lived that life, and that is not easy. So that's what I worry about. So it sounds to me like crypto agility is not a product I can necessarily buy and install. It's more like a, you know, a process, or maybe it's an, an awareness based on my inventory. What, what do you guys think? How, how do I get myself crypto agile? Yeah, I, I don't think there's a one size fits all in, in that case because it really does depend on uh, the heterogeneity of the network that's being considered. You know, how, how much of the devices are uh, IT versus operational technology? You know, that depends on a lot of the critical infrastructure industries have a lot of operational technology that will be at risk as well. And so, you know, back to what I said about, uh, you know, the two points, the second of which is running on a classical computer. Well, classical computers in those cases are very finite resourced, you know, microprocessors that will take some, so you, you really got to understand, A, where the vulnerability is, what does my platform look like across the entire enterprise, including the operational technology devices, um, you know, how can I consider making those updates, updating uh, certificate authorities, the other part that we haven't even talked about yet is what is my supply chain, what does it look like, and I saw some, some questions there about, you know, are, are providers, uh, going to be doing, of course, yeah, there'll be providers that will do updates to the new algorithms and we can talk about the standardization and stuff later, but uh, they will be doing updates. But if you think about the complexity these days of the supply chain and the interdependencies uh, there, I mean, that's a huge part of it as well, is just understanding where your risk can be through your parties and, and, and what you can start to do from a, a procurement perspective, which I've, I've heard some rumblings of already that people are starting to think about that, um, you know, so all these things have to catch up. They, companies can look at their own enterprise. They can look at their operational technology. They can start to impose constraints through contractual agreements. Uh, the standards are still, you know, percolating. The, the FIPS will be out next year from this. Um, so it's hard to point to something from procurement perspective until that's up. You know, there's all these things need to catch up. But again, it really comes back to how big a problem is it going to be for your own organization and how, how do you work your way through these steps? Yeah, it sounds like this inventory that we talked about is key to this, right? So, and that's an inventory not just of my own uh, applications and my own uh, OT, but also of my supply chain, right? So, of everything that I'm uh, using uh, uh, all the way through. So, let's suppose I, I decide uh, I want to do this, right? I want to get crypto agile. I want to prepare my inventory. I want to have this kind of thing uh, worked out. And I'm and I'm a hard pressed uh, CISO or CIO. You know, my budget's being uh, squashed. I'm, I'm going to have to prioritize. How high a priority for the, is, is this for me? Is there any business benefit that I'm going to get from this in the short term, even before the, the quantum computers come along? Or is this purely a kind of preparing for a worst case scenario uh, exercise? I mean, I can offer my opinion in terms of priority. I think it's very high. I mean, inventory right now is probably the top issue for most CISOs in terms of findings, say from regulatory authorities, from external assessment teams, from even from internal, say audit uh, or in, uh, internal audit groups. 
everybody's complaining that things have gotten too complex and we don't know where our digital resources reside. That would be the term that an auditor would use. Um, security and I people would never use a term like that, but you'd see that on a report. So, for example, to get crypto agile, there's a lot of places you got to go look and you need automation. Like 25 years ago, I'd have gotten a bunch of people in a room. We'd have had a spreadsheet and say, all right, uh, look, look, everybody, you go do this. And it'd be this big manual crazy thing where you get the expert and you say, "Where? what have we got? And the expert would tell you, you'd write it down. It'd be crazy, but that's the way we would have done it. Now you go in and you do discovery. This platform sandbox uh, would be one that can, can help you guys where you, you're going to interrogate things like from, from CA, your network, your apps, definitely devices, systems, um, cloud infrastructure. It gets a little weird when you get into third party because like you're probably not going to uh, have this moment of terror and say, oh, my God, we're using um, Microsoft for email. Um, I better go take action to make sure there's no uh, quantum threat to my Office 365. That's probably the reason you've outsourced. So there are third party things, particularly SaaS uh, infrastructure, where you, you'll hope you may want to interrogate a, a vendor, particularly if it's a smaller one, to make sure they're doing that on your behalf. But I, I suspect that'll be a lower priority than things you own. Like if you're throwing workloads off into the cloud and there's cryptography that you're using, then you're going to have to fix it. You know, Amazon's not going to come in and fix that for you. So. It's an enormous task. And, and I think that the priority here is simply how comfortable are you not knowing where your stuff is? Stuff being, you know, anything from data to systems to devices to cryptographic um, uh, tools and systems and algorithms and pro like not knowing that that's just, uh, there's no justification for that. Um, it seems like negligence to me. So, so right now this is a, I believe it's one of the more urgent tasks doing the, uh, the, we would call it cryptographic life cycle management. That's a, a term that often shows up. And I think it's a really good idea. Again, if there's people listening and you say, oh, what should I be taking away from the seminar today? I think that would be it. Um, yeah, this is always a little disappointing sometimes to people because it's such a cool topic. It's so fun to talk about crypto in the context of quantum. And, and I'm with you. It's fascinating, like the, the, the manner in which the mathematics breaks down with conventional cryptography. Very fascinating. But I think in the long run, that's going to be one percent of the issue. Once we've sorted this out and a lot of it is getting sorted out now, going and making this work is really tough. And uh, I think a lot of cryptographers um, don't realize that because most of them don't work in I.T. Yeah, and, and, and I agree. I mean, I, I I did an interview once where I kept on talking about it being very or sort of perfunctory type activity. That oh, it's really boring. And I said, well, I kind of hope so. I mean, there's a there's a particular thread there, but the updates should be as boring as possible. You know, just like, but it but it doesn't make it easy. It's got to be a deep methodology to understand right. and then do the updates. To so your question, Graham, about um, you know benefits, uh, I, I, to generalize broadly, I mean we. We are seeing now areas like financial sector, healthcare, and so on, where there's a desire to be market leading, right? To to show stakeholders um, that uh, the stakeholders and shareholders that the company is market leading, that they're addressing this future uh, leaning problem, and they're addressing it in a in a sort of a cogent, orderly way. You know, they're not again waiting to see what happens and then scrambling at the end. So that's one thing: is market leading. Uh, the other, you know, on the, on the government side, of course, you've probably seen all the, the recent over the last year, the U.S. government um, memos and executive order, where, you know, if you look at that uh, track of activity, you see that it's, it's ramping up, right? And so not only is there a compliance aspect to that, but also the federal government is recognizing it. The U.S. federal government is recognizing that there's a need, again, to go back to some of the things we talked about, you know, in terms of inventory and so on. In terms of the first point I made there about market leading, I want to address one of the questions because it came in asking about, well, that's fine for Fortune 1000 companies, but what about smaller companies? I see this very much akin to when we uh, helped NIST to develop the cybersecurity framework. That was really about getting the right level that was outcome-based. And I could very well imagine 
where there's updates. In fact, I think CISA issued something already where there's updates to essentially a profile for the NIST cybersecurity framework that has broad outcome-based statements like you should do an inventory, you should understand you know, what your vulnerabilities are. And under that, there will be specific implementation uh, actions that could be taken. So companies at least can do the minimal to get a good understanding. Not, not everybody has to go through the full-scale third-party evaluation, for example, that we talked about. For smaller businesses, maybe it's more important to just understand their primary vendors or their own infrastructure. So I think it will be customized for the different sizes of businesses. And I could see someone like this stepping in there and, you know, at least orchestrating the industry would come together to define such a profile. Now, I've heard that topic come up a lot. I, I, I agree 100% with what you're saying. My observation with smaller companies, two things. One is that there's a natural sort of balance that occurs where smaller companies will tend to rely on bigger service providers to do things, you know, maybe more than a bigger company. And that's good because to the degree that you have a partner, let's say you have a managed service provider, and, um, and, and you expect as part of your master service agreement that they'll take care of this, then that's a, that's a very good thing. But on the other hand, I worry sometimes that a smaller company might get unduly concerned about this topic. We can barely get them to, to deal with phishing properly, you know, they, what, clicking on emails from, you know, Trojan.death or something, you know, much less figuring out how to upgrade their cryptography. So I do think that ultimately we're going to, smaller companies, may, maybe somewhere, I don't know, a thousand people less or something. I don't think there's a chance that a small company will be able to manage this upgrade process without great assistance. Mid-size maybe, depends on how mature the team is. But I, I think that one of the reasons a lot of this sounds like we're talking about bigger companies is because this is a bigger activity. The closer you get to infrastructure, the more you need he you know, heavy hands to do it. And and I don't think this is something that your corner grocery store, you know, is going to be able to do or or should be doing. So probably need to, as, an, as a society, figure out how to ensure that nobody's getting left behind. I come from a service provider background, so I admit my bias, but I do think that smaller companies would be wise to make sure they have a good, solid partner to help them here. Instead of, you know, what, watching videos to figure out how to do it that that would not be wise that would be bad. okay so so let's assume then that we we're in a big organization and you know I, I'm, on, I'm on this webinar here and i'm, I'm very much aware that uh, getting ready for crypto agility inventory all, all these things are, are great things to do but uh, but i haven't yet got that uh, kind of buy-in from above my my budget for that is there anything you know useful to my business that i can do as a kind of starting point uh, you know, is it worth me doing, you know, some kind of quantum risk assessment or, or maybe an, an impact assessment on how these post quantum algorithms are going to affect me? Is, is, is that something worth doing? Yeah, maybe even now. Yeah, I think so. Um, and, and oftentimes what we're seeing is that companies have an appetite to do something on a limited basis, uh, you know, a small part of their network, for example. Uh, you can't always extrapolate that, of course, and say that's how it is for the whole network, but at least gives them an understanding on that small basis, you know, what the scope of the problem might be for them. And, uh, you know, there are there are tools out there to help with that. And, you know, maybe I see one of the questions, Graham, is about, you know, how can inventory of cryptographic systems be automated? So maybe at some point you might want to talk a bit about, you know, sandbox tools for doing that. Um, but, I, but I think that that's, we are seeing, you know, where a limited scope... Um, assessment is giving an organization, again, sort of a sample, right, of what they're going to see with their broader network. I, I would say that um, and maybe this, and again, I you know, always seem to agree, Colin, you make, make such good points. On the, on the question what to do now, this is going to sound a little surface, but I'll say it anyway. If you want more people to come to your afternoon symposium, then talk about quantum agility. But if you want CFO to approve a project, Talk about cryptographic agility because that's deployed now and, and that's part of your existing risk profile. And the idea that you may not have proper visibility into what's going on is a legitimate issue. That's why I think with deployment of cryptographic lifecycle tools like, like, uh, like Sandbox, um, 
it's not about the, you know, oh my gosh, five years from now, seven years from ten, uh, you, uh, then I get this payoff. That's that's silly. It's about establishing a baseline today of what you've got, and that's going to pay dividends immediately. That is completely irrelevant to quantum to do a good um, a good automated data collection inventory. And there's a lot of different ways you can do it, but um, that's a that's a today thing. That's somebody if you're li listening to our voices right now and you think that's not going on in your team, and you're a, you know at least a medium to larger company, then that's a big mistake. That's a gap. And if somebody hasn't found it yet, somebody somebody like me is prone to come around and find it. So um, so that that is a very popular finding right now in, uh, for regulatory and security teams. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I often joke it's never a bad time to look at the attic, right? You might not like what you find in the attic, but if you know if quantum is the reason that you've gone up there to take a look around, there's usually things to be found there that need to be resolved that are totally unrelated. Thing. Yeah, it's a very good thing to do now. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, Colin and Ed, for your, for your contributions there. So we're going to switch over to Q and A now. Uh, and so there's a whole bunch of questions in uh, the chat. So thanks very much, everyone, for, for contributing there. There are a couple of questions, I think, as you mentioned, talking about automation to prepare crypto inventory and crypto agility. So let me use that as, a, as an excuse to just talk a little bit about the products that we're building inside my group uh, in the quantum security group at, at Sandbox AQ. So we do have a suite of tools for automating crypto inventory gathering that takes a, a fully holistic approach to what you have. So we look on uh, network traffic, we look at files and file systems, operating system processes. We can look inside applications as they call uh, their cryptographic libraries. And all of this can be automated. It can be uh, scaled up in its deployment through CI pipelines and through endpoint managers. So we've got solutions both for your own applications and for what you're running on your own uh, endpoints. Uh, and at the end of the, uh, the webcast today, you should be receiving a mail from our marketing people that will give you uh, some next steps and some, some follow-ups if you want to take that a little bit further. Um, but yeah, that's really the core of what we're doing inside the quantum security group. And there's another question, which is about actual agility in the sense of changing algorithms in a kind of um, instantaneous way. So inside the quantum security group, we have uh, a product called the, the QSG crypto service. That is a platform that you can build your future applications on or even migrate your legacy applications to that will give you uh, the ability to change cryptographic algorithms. Um, but as we've talked about a few times, uh, in the end, it's not about pressing a button, a big flashing red button that switches your algorithms from, from one to another across your entire organization. It's about having that visibility and understanding those dependencies that will remove the business continuity risk of making such a change that's really the key part of what the, the quantum security group at Sandbox provides. So that crypto service is giving you visibility on what you have so that you can make those decisions to change without uh, in getting across that business risk. So yeah, as I said, uh, we'll be following up with everybody um, to, with a little bit of material about that so you'll be able to, to dive in uh, and find a bit more. So there's a few questions about the NIST standardization process. So let me kind of summarize that a little bit. So uh, since the NIST process isn't completely finished yet, so there are not implementations following a, a standardized implementation, even if, even if we know which algorithms have, have won, uh, you know, can we do anything with that now? Are we, are we, uh, is, is the NIST process something that we can action right now? And I'll open that up to either of you two to, to help me out with that. I would say they already have. I mean, I, I feel like it's been an impressive process, six years and still going. And Still more algorithms to pick. So, so just by raising the um, attention in our community, in the cybersecurity community, to these issues, I, I think is al already actionable. It demonstrates that um, these algorithms are are in existence. The the thing that again worries me is that if you go back and look at the history of commercial grade cryptography, and I've used that. To differentiate from you know what you might find um, in a uh, intelligence or, or like what NSA or GCHQ, that's a, kind of a different discussion. But the stuff that we all use, if you look at that, it's always been a, a question of cat and mouse. And uh, again, I, I'm not a good enough cryptographer to 
to uh, opine on whether we've had enough time and enough scrutiny to place all our eggs into these baskets. Well, I guess we have to trust NIST. But I think over the next couple to few years, I'd keep a very close watch on NIST and their process and these algorithms. And as they go out into trial, I think that that's all really important stuff. And I know the team at Sandbox, uh, you, you guys uh, keep a close watch. But the, I think, from a, again, from a NIST perspective, I personally feel like it's been a nice open process. And that's I, I, I feel like it's been a good process. I've read people criticizing this, you know, about how they've um, done stuff. But I, I don't. I, th I think it's been a, a, a pretty good process. I think they've done a good job answering a lot of the questions people might have. Colin, I don't know where you stand on that, but I, I feel like... Yeah, I mean, you know, one of, one of the things, we always thought of, one of our former cyber leaders, used to, and I, I love being, he always used to talk about, you know, we sit at the intersection of uh, risk, regulation, and technology. And, and what, what do you mean by that? You know, you've got to assess the risk as technology evolves, and somewhere out in the horizon there's regulation, right? I think that one thing that is very important for me to delineate is NISC right now is defining the core cryptographic standards, which I don't know the details. I'm not a mathematician, but I believe that they're very deterministic, those standards, right? You just, it's a certain, math, a certain mathematical functions that operate in a deterministic way. Above that is going to be implementation guidance and the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, which operates under the auspices of NIST as well. They're defining some implementation guidance through the project that they're running. Above that, you know, one, one next level is things like frameworks, as I mentioned before, which can give general guidance on how implementations can go or it can state outcomes, you know, be be robust against uh, a, a, a cryptographically relevant quantum computer, you know, make sure your data are all protected and all that sort of thing. And then further down the line is regulations, right, where regulators make pick up some of those standards, frameworks, um, as they've done in the past with things like the NIST cybersecurity framework. If I go way back, though, to that initial layer again, you know, the cryptographic standard, my understanding, again, is they're, they're fairly deterministic. NIST is likely now looking at implementation, you know, the configuration of those and, and the like. I doubt very much that that means that those algorithms are going to change. You know, how you configure them and use them will likely change over time. But as they go through that process to create the federal information processing standard, which is their target for next year, I don't think there's any harm in, in evaluating that now and actually implementing it alongside the other suite of algorithms that one would want to have in a crypto agile solution anyway. Uh, and just continue to do that. There may be some companies that say, even though NIST has published the FIPS next year, perhaps they want to wait and see what happens with Etsy or ISO as it goes to the international. Our our guidance is, uh, to our clients is really that again, these are. It's not it's not sort of trying to evaluate guidance. It's more about a deterministic set of processes that is standardized. So we don't think there'll be a lot of changes. There might be additions, as, as Ed said. There might be new ones coming into the fold. And certainly, NIST has, has that door open. But I don't think there's any harm in starting to look at the existing ones just now and be ready to implement those. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Well, look, we're getting close to the, the time limit now, and I want to be respectful of people's agendas and the, the time that we've asked them to, to allocate. So I'm just going to give both of you a chance to, to say, if you wanted um, our attendees to take uh, one thing away from this talk today, uh, what would that be? Well, I would say that there are differences between the way mathematicians approach cryptography and problems like this and the way day-to-day -day security teams have to deal with exactly the same issue. They come at it from very different perspectives. And while I well, certainly, um, you know, is great fun to watch and track how these algorithms work and actually to try to understand them, it's quite a, a challenge and for people who enjoy that. That is, um, you know, re re can be re really quite rewarding. I believe that the biggest problem here and the biggest risk is change. So wh when we when we're changing things out now at broad scale on the most important infrastructure level, we'll probably get it right. You know, you probably when you're you know using um, you know with your service provider and using your mobile phone or something to the degree the keys are being negotiated, that'll be done properly. But some broadband provider, a smaller one that's doing this or that and somebody misconfigures and something's not right. It's gonna be stuff like that that cause the problem. So the crypto might be great, 
But if you misconfigure, you fat finger, you do something wrong, it may not even be outages. It could be things left in clear text in the worst case. So I'm guessing that as we get closer to full deployment, that's what you're going to be reading about. You're going to be reading about people, system administrators goofing things up. Not that um, you know necessarily the algorithms were wrong, even though my earlier comment, we do have to watch because historically, people do break crypto algorithms. That's 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 what crypto analysts do. So so it's going to be an interesting few years. But again, my key takeaway: these very different perspectives from um, mathematicians and IT teams. They're looking at the same topic, but they see something very different. I always remember a mentor of mine at university used to say. Um, an understood problem is a manageable problem. And I think it, it comes to mind as we're going through this. You know, just understand, you got to understand what the issue is. I mean, you don't want to be hit later on. Oh, we got to do this upgrade. What, what, what does that mean for us? Or what does it involve? So getting at least a basic level of understanding of what your organizational vulnerability is, is critical here. Yeah, it all comes back to that that crypto inventory, which I guess is my message for everyone. Uh, really, you can, you can get a great big payoff from, from starting that project right now. We've seen that with our, our customers already. All right, awesome. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Thanks also to everyone who wrote a question. As we said, we'll be following up with some people uh, as well for questions that we weren't able to answer today. Uh, but thanks very much for your time, and I look forward to seeing you guys, Colin and Ed, again soon, hopefully in person, and, and all of you on the next uh, webinar here. At Sandbox AQ. Thanks very much. Thank you.